Good morning everyone. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, and really you should, is to learn about the fascinating history of audio formats and gain some important insight into how best to organise and preserve them. London Metropolitan Archives is one of ten regional hubs across the UK that joined the British Library's Unlocking Our Sound Heritage project in 2018 to help preserve almost half a million rare and at-risk sound recordings. But another key component of this campaign is to pass on some of these preservation skills to the great British public and beyond, empowering others to unlock their own sonic heritage as well. This presentation is designed to help you identify various sound carrying formats that you'll encounter as you work with sound archives, with some suggestions as how best to catalogue and preserve them. We'll be going in roughly chronological order and assuming very little prior knowledge in order to accommodate as many people as possible, but regardless of your experience, going over the basics is seldom a bad idea. Our journey through time begins, as is traditional, with some plaintive harp music. Paris, France, 1857. It all begins with this man, Leon Scott de Martinville, and his invention of the phonautograph. This ingenious device transcribes sound waves into a moving line traced on smoke-blackened paper or glass. Technically, the phonautograph is intended to help study the nature of acoustics, not to be used as a playback device, but the entire history of recorded sound very much begins here. Furthermore, several of these vintage transcriptions, or phonautograms, were actually analysed and then converted back into sound in 2008, making them the oldest sound recordings known to humankind, for now at least. 1877 New Jersey, USA. In his Menlo Park laboratory, Thomas Edison invents the phonograph, and with it the dawn of analogue sound playback. When speaking into a mouthpiece, the sound vibrations press against a membrane. A steel needle fitted to the membrane embosses these vibrations into the tin foil wrapped around a metal drum. It's a recording technique similar to the phonautograph, with the difference that the embossed groove can now be replayed by inserting a stylus. This is followed three years later by Alexander Graham Bell and his graphophone, and then rapidly followed again by an improved version of Edison's phonograph in 1887. The phonograph uses cylinders initially made from beeswax, and then a kind of hardened metallic soap, and later celluloid, although the name wax cylinder is how we typically think of them today. As you can see, they are visibly fragile and must be handled with extreme care, placing fingers inside the hollow centre to avoid touching the outside edges. Cylinders such as this one became the predominant sound carrier from the late 1880s until around the time of the First World War, when they are superseded by the gramophone disc. If you look closely, you can see the groove cut vertically into the cylinder. We have now entered the age where recordings can be mass produced and made commercially available for the first time, though the format is far from perfect. Aside from being brittle and fragile, early wax cylinders in particular can only be played a handful of times before beginning to degrade. Simply playing back the cylinder is to cause damage to it. And that's before we even begin to talk about this format's propensity for attracting mould, which will go on to prove something of a headache for anyone trying to document them a century or more later. So, if your collection does include cylinders, then surely the most pressing action is to roll up your sleeves and start digitising them all as quickly as possible, right? <coughs> Not so fast. It is generally believed that the vast majority of commercially released phonograph cylinders have in fact been digitised already. Furthermore, both the equipment and expertise required to perform this delicate operation are hard to find and prohibitively expensive. If you have reason to believe you're in possession of a unique recording of particular importance, then the most sensible thing would probably be to delegate this work to an organisation that actually owns the equipment and has the expertise to operate it, such as the British Library. We now begin to move into the modern age of recorded sound with the arrival of the gramophone or shellac disc in 1887. Developed by Emile Berliner, the discs were made from mineral powders such as lime and slate dust bound by organic polymer or glue. In the early days, this polymer was made from the natural resin sticklac, produced from the secretions of lac insects which live on acacia trees in India and Southeast Asia. The gramophone would go on to become the predominant sound carrying format well into the 1950s. Recordings would be inscribed as a lateral mono groove onto a flat rotating disc, and copies of this could be made with a stamper, 
in a manner very similar to the PVC vinyl records which come later. As a result, it's tempting to assume that you can simply play them on your modern turntable. But sadly, life is rarely that simple. Gramophone discs generally play at 78 revolutions per minute, which is much faster than the microgroove records 33 or 45 revolutions per minute. You'll also need a specific stylus, or needle, which nowadays can only be acquired from specialist dealers. It's a jungle out there. As with their phonograph predecessors, the gramophone discs are notoriously brittle, easily damaged and can only be played a finite number of times, particularly the early examples. Despite all this, they tend to be pretty hardy, and if they've been properly looked after, they should last for another few decades at least. Polyvinyl microgroove discs began to emerge in the 1950s and continue to be one of the most popular and enduring sound carrying formats today, with millions of brand new vinyl albums sold each year. To help avoid confusion, there are some obvious visual differences between these two formats. The shellac discs are of course visibly older than the vinyl LPs, but also quite a bit thicker, heavier, less flexible and more brittle. Strangely enough, they also feel colder to the touch and have a very distinctive resinous smell as a result of their makeup. Basically, they smell old. PVC microgroove records, more commonly referred to as vinyl, are thinner, lighter and more flexible, though that is not a green light to go around trying to bend them. Their sound quality is noticeably better than the hissy, poppy sound of their shellac ancestors, which often made it sound like the music or speech had been recorded while cooking an enormous fried breakfast. The thinner grooves and slower playing speeds allowed for more music and better sound quality and, for the first time, stereo. While less breakable than their shellac ancestors, vinyl LPs are easily scratched and marked by accident, which can lead to the stylus jumping grooves or becoming stuck, or becoming stuck, or becoming stuck. <laughs> Plus they're susceptible to static charge, the build up of dust and grime, and perhaps worst of all, warping, especially if stored incorrectly. Whichever type of disc you're working with, observing some basic rules is advisable. Handle all discs with extreme care, holding each with the rim between your palms, hands at 3 and 9 o'clock, and being sure never to touch the grooves with your fingers. Never place records on top of one another, even when they are in their sleeves. Store them vertically upright on a sturdy shelf or in a wooden crate, and ensure they're not leaning on one another. Even a small collection of records can weigh an awful lot, so do ensure your shelving and your flooring is able to cope with them. Make sure they are in a cool, dry environment away from all sources of heat. Placing a collection near such things as radiators and heating pipes is a surefire way to ruin it. All records must be stored in a paper inner sleeve and a cardboard outer sleeve. New sleeves can be purchased cheaply online if required. It's advisable to get rid of any shrink wrap as this can shrink further over time and cause damage to the sleeve. If the collection includes novelty records such as picture discs which have been stored in PVC covers, remove these at once and replace them with a paper or card alternative as there is growing evidence that proximity to PVC covers can damage vinyl over time. Obviously don't throw them away if it's an integral part of the package, just store them separately. Also avoid packing them too closely together as this can cause ring wear damage to the sleeves, but also not so loosely that they are leaning against one another. Rest assured, it's not as delicate a balancing act as it sounds, and once you've got it right, those records should sit in storage quite happily for years. We now travel back to the 1940s with the arrival of magnetic tape, which began to emerge towards the end of the Second World War. Basically, a layer of oxidised particles suspended in a binding agent, or a kind of glue, on a plastic backing, or substrate, sound energy is captured on the tape by being converted into a magnetic charge as the particles pass over the recording head of a tape machine. It's effectively a form of sorcery as far as we're concerned. Magnetic tape was similar in principle to another emerging format of the early 20th century, the wire recorder with the most notable difference being that it didn't turn into a potentially lethal weapon if anything went wrong. Initially, tapes are made from acetate, and then as we move into the 1960s, they begin to be manufactured from polyester, although some rare examples were even made from oxide-coated paper. It's important to be able to differentiate between the different versions of magnetic tape so that we can decide how best to preserve them. A neat little trick is to hold the spool up to a strong light source, perhaps like the one attached to a portable telephone. 
If the tape remains dark when you shine the light through it, then it's a modern tape made from polyester. If you can clearly see the light through the compacted tape, you have yourself an acetate reel and a bit of a headache. You see, acetate reels are quite a bit trickier to deal with. Besides being older than their polyester counterparts, their composition is problematic for an archivist. The acetate breaks down over time, which can cause shrinkage and curling. As a result, the tape can become brittle and snap easily. Acetate-based tapes must never be baked in an oven, a particular process of preservation that we'll come to later. If upon inspection you discover the tape is giving off a strong vinegary smell, then this is a sure sign that degradation is already taking place, and at that stage there's not a huge amount you can do to reverse the process. If your collection does happen to include tape reels, prioritising the acetate spools over the polyester is a good place to begin. Polyester reels are generally a bit more stable, but in their own way can prove equally problematic. A build-up of moisture over time can cause the breaking down of the tape and produce an unpleasant squealing sound during playback. This is known as sticky shed syndrome. Here's a quick blast of what it sounds like when you try and play it. Most unpleasant. Furthermore, the binding agent holding the magnetised particles in place can begin to break down, causing the tape to free itself and become loose from the substrate. This is generally noticeable only upon playback, but in severe cases this degradation can be observed even while simply handling the tape. We've had some memorably catastrophic incidents on the UWASH project, especially the time when the degradation happened to coincide with a programme of freeform jazz music. Worryingly, this particular reel was only around 30 years old and was considered professional quality tape stock designed for archival purposes. But then, there are many different manufacturers and brands of tape out there and quality can be variable. This might just have been an unlucky coincidence, a defective batch of stock, or the result of poor storage conditions. But even so, stepping out for a cup of tea or a small sandwich while leaving a tape unattended is seldom a wise move. There can be other problems too. Print through is caused by the recorded signal on one layer of tape being transferred to an adjacent layer. Not surprising when you consider the layers spend years being tightly packed together. This can result in a weird pre-echo occurring where you can hear the recording faintly just before it begins. This can often be remedied by fast forwarding and rewinding the tape before playback. But if possible, it's a good idea to store the tape's tails out to prevent this happening or at least stop it being so noticeable. This is known as a library wind. Another common problem can occur when the tape has become entangled or detached itself from the spool, especially during playback. A 10 inch spool may contain well over one kilometre of tape, which has the potential to make an awful mess on the floor if you're not careful, or stop the traffic outside if things go really badly. And even if the tape itself isn't degraded, the splicing tape used to hold it together might well be. Spools of tape may often be composites, consisting of several different recordings from several different tapes spliced together, much in the same way that an album is a collection of different tracks. Or an interview may have sections removed or edited, which would be made with a razor blade, a splicing block and splicing tape, for our purposes not that different from sticky tape. And just like sticky tape, these can dry out and become brittle and then snap. But the somewhat surprising flip side of all this is that tape is also a hardier beast than you might first assume. It is very rare indeed that a spool of tape refuses to offer up at least some of its contents when you play it. Even that jazzy tape from earlier gave us a pretty decent sounding recording upon digitisation, although we did have to do an awful lot of hoovering afterwards. Splices can be repaired or replaced with new ones. Tape that has become loose or detached can also be successfully untangled and then wound back onto the spool. It's painstaking work, but in our experience if your nerves can handle it, then so can the tape. At one point on the UWASH project, we received a large consignment of tape coiled up in an old carrier bag. Two hours and a fair amount of patience later, and it was as good as new. Well, almost. Any tape suffering from sticky shed syndrome or the buildup of moisture can be improved by baking the tapes in an oven or dehumidifier, although as always caution is advised. Tapes should be baked at 50 degrees Celsius for 8 hours and allowed to heat up and return to room temperature naturally. 
It's not a permanent solution, but it should solve the problem for a few days when the time comes to digitize the contents. One very important point, as mentioned before, you must never bake acetate tapes, only polyester. If in doubt, remember to use the light source test and also the following helpful mnemonic. Tape is opaque, perfect to bake. Light shines through, last thing you should do. There are plenty of things you can do yourself to help preserve tapes for the future. Ensure that they are stored in a cool, dry environment with low humidity. Store them upright in their boxes and isolate any mouldy specimens to avoid them contaminating other parts of the collection. In summary, tape can certainly prove awkward to work with, but it's perhaps the hardest and most reliable of all the formats we've been working with on the UWASH project. In fact, the team at LMA haven't lost a single spool yet, although it has got rather messy on occasion. Let's move on, shall we? Well, on to another tape at least, with the development of the compact cassette in 1963. Essentially a shrunk down reel-to-reel -reel enclosed in a plastic head shell, it became the world's primary portable sound carrying medium and enjoyed decades of popularity, particularly with the invention of the Sony Walkman in the late 1970s, which meant that you could listen to your favourite music wherever you went. And best of all, you could make your own recordings, which is why so many generations have fond memories of creating mixtapes for each other. The beauty of a cassette was that music and other recordings could now be acquired, duplicated and passed around quickly and simply. It's arguable that without a sturdy, portable format like the cassette, great swathes of 20th century history and culture would never have been documented. Where would oral history be without the ability to record cheaply and easily wherever you were? It remained the most popular portable sound carrier until superseded by the MP3 player in the early 2000s, but has enjoyed an impressive resurgence in recent years, largely thanks to independent artists and musicians who lack the budget to produce a vinyl LP, but still want their music to appear as a tangible object with a great deal of charm. There's just something friendly and reassuring about the cassette, and the chances are they will make up the vast majority of the audio collections you'll encounter, even more so than reel-to-reel -reel tape. Cassettes come in four main types, identified by the different markings on the top of the casing, although this is more for the attention of the cassette machine you're putting it in and rarely worth losing sleep over. What is useful to check is whether the tabs on top of the casing have been removed, which can help avoid the contents being accidentally recorded over. At the bottom, we can see space where the tape passes over the playhead, although note here that what we actually see is the white leader tape that occurs at the beginning and the end of the spool, telling us this cassette has been fully wound, which is exactly how they should be stored to prevent the playing surface becoming damaged. The cassette is a beautifully simple piece of engineering that more often than not will play almost as well today as it did two decades ago. While they will never win any awards for high fidelity compared with vinyl or compact disc, their sturdy design meant that they could take a fair amount of abuse. We've gone through hundreds of cassettes at Unlocking Our Sound Heritage, and it's very rare indeed that we find one that is completely beyond repair. Particularly if they have been stored responsibly, upright and fully wound in individual boxes in a cool, dry environment with low humidity. Are you beginning to notice a pattern here? Of course, there are occasions when it's less simple. Cassettes can suffer from many of the same complaints that affect the reel-to-reel, -reel, especially after a long hibernation. Once again, the most common issue is the build-up of moisture inside the tape spool, particularly if the cassettes have been stored in a damp, cold environment such as an attic or garage. Print-through or pre-echo can also be an issue. Like its bigger cousin, the reel-to-reel, -reel, cassette tape is effectively magnetised particles suspended in a binding agent, packed tightly together on a spool. And the problem is the same. Over time, the particles of one layer can begin to bleed through to the adjoining layer it's in contact with, although higher quality brands of reel-to-reel -reel tape have a thicker substrate layer which can help to prevent this. The good news is that in many cases this can be remedied at the digitisation stage by running the tape in fast forward and then rewinding it in the machine before playing. Damage to the tape itself can be a more serious issue. The cassette might be a hardy enough format, but the actual tape is very fragile when not packed into its protective head shell. And damage can occur when left exposed for long periods at the bottom of the casing, or when played through a badly maintained machine. Anyone of a certain age will have painful memories of cassette players eating their favourite tape. Unfortunately, these are occasions when prevention is infinitely preferable to cure. Avoid tapes becoming damaged in the first place by always storing your tapes fully wound, like the example we showed a moment ago. 
Make sure the leader tape is all that's visible at the bottom of the cassette before you place it back into storage. We now jump forward to 1982, the year that saw the launch of Channel 4, the Barbican Centre, and more pertinently to our business here, the compact disc. Developed in tandem by Philips and Sony, this shiny little disc can store almost 80 minutes of crystal clear digital audio on a surface just 120 millimeters across, that's a mere four and three quarter inches, and only 1.2 millimeters thick. Audio data is recorded as a series of binary digits embedded on a spiral five kilometers long and over 60 times thinner than the groove of an LP, a series of pits and spaces that would be converted into analog sound when read by a laser. With the digital audio content being protected from scratches and fingerprints by a layer of plastic, CDs were initially touted as being indestructible. Indeed, some TV presenters at the time felt confident enough to demonstrate this by attacking them with stones or spreading honey all over them. We would strongly advise against trying either of these at home. Childish stunts aside, however, the CD was quickly adopted and became the dominant format for commercial music right up to the present day, only really superseded by the rise of streaming and download services in the 21st century. It's easy to see why. Very good sound quality, relatively durable, lightweight and portable, but they're certainly not indestructible, or even honey-proof. Scratches, smudges and other marks on the playing surface can cause the disc to skip, 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 or play incorrectly, or sometimes refuse to play at all. But if a disc has clearly been well looked after, is visibly in good condition and has been kept in its box, it can be considered a low-risk item that should remain stable for years to come. Sadly, the same can absolutely not be said for what came next. The CDR, or recordable CD, was introduced six years later, a blank disc that allowed consumers to create their own recordings for the first time. Digital information was imprinted, or burned to use the parlance of the time, in a die suspended on the disc beneath a layer of polycarbonate plastic. This was followed in 1997 by the rewritable CD, or CDRW, which allowed for discs to have multiple recordings added to them at different times. They look like compact discs, and they offer the CD's portability and convenience with the added bonus that you could create your own, but for archivists they are often little more than a shiny nightmare. Despite their comparatively recent development, CDRs are undoubtedly the most troublesome of all the formats we've covered here. For a start, they degrade extremely rapidly. Even in ideal storage conditions, a lifespan of 10 years for a CDR is considered optimistic. And with so many brands of varying quality control on the market, many CDRs will be lucky to last even that short time. The data on the disc can become unreadable as the die breaks down, and the addition of sticky labels and notes with marker pen can cause further damage. A broken or damaged tape or vinyl disc will usually give you at least something to work with. On the very rare occasions when we've come across an item that has completely refused to give up its contents, 95% of the time the pesky little troublemaker is a CDR. If you're organising your collections and working out which items to prioritise, it is most important to be able to differentiate between regular CDs and CDRs, as they are basically at opposite ends of the scale. Thankfully the differences aren't too hard to spot, especially when placing the upturned discs next to one another and comparing the colouring of the playing surface. Regular CDs will be silver in colour, while CDRs will often have a blue or greenish tinge to the disc. How about another helpful mnemonic to tide you along? If it's silver and white, it's a CD all right. The bluer the disc, the greater the risk. If in any doubt, simply treat it as a CDR and make plans to digitise the contents at your earliest convenience. While it might seem strange to say so after all our talk regarding formats that are decades older, we would seriously recommend starting your preservation adventures here in the 1990s. Sliding back now to 1987, the era of big shoulder pads, big hair and even bigger phones, but very small tapes. Sony unveiled the digital audio tape and the place goes wild. It promises a small portable sound recording medium that isn't susceptible to the problems suffered by analog tape and seemingly offers perfect sound reproduction. It spools like a conventional tape but has a rotary head and tracks are written diagonally to achieve high data rates similar to VHS tapes but better. By 1992, over 80% of recording studios have themselves a DAT machine, but 
where are they now? Despite being a relatively reliable format, the tapes and equipment were expensive and it never reached mainstream adoption. Sony stopped manufacturing DAT machines in 2005, although the format did live on in professional studios for quite some time after. It's actually rather a shame, they probably deserved better. A similar fate befell that of the mini-disc that Sony introduced five years later in 1992. Generally a sturdy and reliable format, it uses a digital compression technique called A-Track or Adaptive Transform Acoustic Coding, which is supposedly not detectable by a quote-unquote normal person's ear, but which nonetheless upsets audiophiles everywhere, in theory at least. We've decided to group these two digital formats together because they both share one very interesting problem. For both DAT and Minidisc, questions of degradation and damage tend to be less of a concern than actually being able to find something to play them on in the first place. There is a creditable theory that there are now less DAT machine playing hours left in the world than there are actual tapes. And when was the last time you saw a Minidisc player? With no new DAT machines being manufactured since 2005, and no new Minidisc players since 2011, you may find preservation a race against time while there are still functioning machines to work with. We'd recommend placing them in the queue just behind CDRs, assuming you have the equipment to hand. The Minidisc also has the sad honour of being the last ever analogue sound carrying format. We have reached the end of the line. And now that our journey across time and format has come to a close, let's quickly recap. When going through your collections and deciding what to prioritise, here are some things to take into account. Carrier degradation. As we've seen, modern formats such as CDRs can often degrade more quickly than older formats. The technical obsolescence of the playback equipment. As we've seen from DATs and minidiscs, age might not be the only factor. The significance of the collection itself. Obviously the importance of the recordings is paramount, the priorities of your own institution, and the aims of your particular project. In the meantime, store everything in a cool, dry place with low humidity, store all tapes upright, fully wound and in their boxes, ideally store reel-to-reel -reel tapes tail out using a library wind, Prioritise the older or visibly fragile items as a general rule, particularly acetate tape. Prioritise unique one-off recordings over commercial releases. And of course, handle all archive material with extreme care, making sure your hands are clean and dry and never touching the playing surface. And when the time comes to digitise the collection, seek a conservationist's advice as to whether to bake the tapes or not. But if they do give you the go ahead, bake them at 50 degrees for 8 hours, being sure to allow them to heat up and cool down naturally before and after. We would suggest leaving them overnight. And of course, digitise everything at 96 kHz 24 bit WAV file, in keeping with the guidelines of the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives. You can visit them at iasa web.org. And so there we have it. This tape will self-destruct unless stored upright in a library wind under cool dry conditions with low humidity. Good luck everyone. <laughs>